Hello and welcome to Snapshot. I'm your host, Alan Wolf, and on this edition, we're going to take you along with us on an exciting ride with Carl Gable's fire department. First order of business, a rescue call. Stay with us. Well, Alan Wolf back with you. As promised, continuing with the excitement here on Snapshot. We have a call now, Captain. Where are we headed? What's going on? We're heading to the uh, central part of Coral Gables, and it's a uh, difficulty breathing call. It's a rescue call. And uh, the only reference we have is to somebody having difficulty breathing. What uh, units would you generally uh, have respond on this type of call? Uh, a rescue truck. One rescue truck. And your, and your job once you get there as the battalion commander? Uh, well, actually, the only reason I'm responding right now is because I have you in the truck. I normally would not respond to this type of call unless specifically called for. Understood. We'll be arriving in just a moment. Well, we have arrived on this call, and the situation so far seems to be there is somebody having problems breathing. We're going to let you know just what happens as soon as the captain comes out. We are not permitted in this case to go in and bring this to you as it's happening. Basically what happened here, and we are en route to another emergency call. We had a pedestrian hit on by the University of Miami. OK, and this particular call we're on with a person not breathing well? They're stable. OK, onward. Next emergency call, Carl Gable's fire rescue is rolling. OK, well, as we arrive here, we haven't had any information really yet as to what the situation is. But we do see rescue and the police here on the scene. And uh, as you can see, there is somebody who, well, they, at least they're up and talking. Is that a good sign? Yeah, a very good sign. Looks like a bicyclist, bicyclist kid. We'll see in just a moment. And of course, we will take snapshot viewers along with us. How are you doing? Yeah, he's riding his uh, bicycle and hit something in the pavement and clipped the, uh, the pole. Yeah, clipped the pole. He's got a hematoma, nice size hematoma to his right forearm and some abrasions underneath the, underneath the uh, upper arm. How are you doing otherwise? I tried getting up a couple of times and I started feeling like fatigue. And uh, it's a little while to pass out. Have you been feeling. drinking fluid? Water. It's dry, it's dry. Uh, 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 I uh, the uh, 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 when I did experience it was a little like shaking on my right side of my eye. Like it was uh, 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 What happened here, Captain? Alan, well, we had a bicyclist that uh, apparently hit an obstruction on the road and uh, hit the uh, pole and injured himself against the pole and then fell on the road. He says he feels a little dizzy and a little uh, faint, but other than that, it seems like his injuries are minor. Lucky man. Yeah. Uh, normally, he's going to have to be screened and uh, checked for a head injury. Now, this is, of course, in the city limits of Carl Gables, no question about that, but I see here that the University of Miami police are here. Do they handle this entire area in and around the university? Well, this area is a, a fringe area. Uh, they respond here, and so does the Coral Gables Police Department. Well, we also have another call just came in, uh, diabetic coma at Alphonse. Have, do we have any word on that situation? Not yet. I'm, that's what I'm listening for. Well, of course, another job well done by the men and women of the Coral Gables Fire Department. Well, as promised, as you can always expect on Snapchat, we are en route to our next call. Captain Pablo Gonzalez, this is a diabetic situation. As we spoke about before, we are responding. The, the diabetic situation can often mimic somebody who's intoxicated, I understand. That's correct. It's a very common assumption when they see somebody acting strangely. They, uh, they think that, it was, uh, that he's drunk. Yeah, 
Captain Gonzalez, we can see now that the victim here is being taken out of the house. What is the next step here? And what was the situation? The uh, patient was having a uh, diabetic crisis, and uh, rescue arrived in the scene. First of all, the rescue was kind of far away, and uh, we dispatched an engine company because the engine was closer. So the engine came and started stabilizing the patient, and shortly thereafter, the rescue arrived. So then... once the uh, rescue arrived, then they started invasive uh, drug therapy and uh, neutralized pretty much the diabetic coma. They determine how this happened? Uh, she has a history of diabetes, and uh, there must be some kind of imbalance in, in the, her diabetic system right now. OK, now they're putting her into the rescue vehicle. What happens from this point on? OK, from this point on, uh, they go ahead and they make communications with the hospital on the uh, medical radio. And they let them know what they have and what they're coming in and what they've done. So the physicians then are ready. They can think ahead. Pretty much so. That, it gives that's you like a warning. That's something you don't have the pleasure of being able to do on many of these calls. You just have to get there and do your thing. That's correct. You don't have a real big advance notice of just no, what you're going no, to this, find this on is, the scene. This is one of the reasons why when we get down, if you'll notice, every person that gets down from the truck is carrying at least two pieces of apparatus with them. Now, you mentioned that the, the, the engine arrived here first. Uh, all of these people who ride the engine and not fire rescue are also uh, trained as EMTs? Uh, I would say probably 90% of our personnel are EMTs. And we usually are lucky enough to have uh, one paramedic on each truck, well, uh, although that's not always the case. Well, it is certainly a busy job that you have. It's certainly a job that requires instant thinking, being able to respond at a moment's notice. And right after this, we will continue with the action right here on Snapshot, along with the Coral Gables Fire Department. Stay with us. She is one of America's toughest drug enforcement agents. Last year, she helped convict 90 drug dealers, seized several tons of crack and marijuana, and closed down 10 major drug operations. She is a 68-year-old grandmother named Irma. She set up a community drug watch that is not only changing her neighborhood, but its future. There are many ways to help in your community. Call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. Alan Wolf back with you right here on Snapshot, taking you for a behind the scenes look at things that you probably have never seen before. One of them is this magnificent truck, this fire apparatus called the service truck. And joining us here at the service truck is the driver of this truck, Charlie Davis, and uh, he's a firefighter with the Carl Gables Fire Department. Lots of doors here, Charlie. Let's see what's behind Let's see door number what's one. What's behind door number one? Well, you're really getting into this television thing, aren't you? Tell you what, put some people in front of a camera, you know, and everybody wants to take over. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. All right, what we've got here is some first aid equipment. We've got an oxygen uh, respirator. We've got some first aid gear. A ice cooler with some ice water for basically refreshment after you come out of a fire and you need a, a few minutes of break time before you go back in to build up your energy again. We, we, are, we change fresh ice water every day. Is this equipment here primarily in... in case rescue doesn't arrive before you do? Uh, that or uh, if for some reason uh, some firefighters come over to this truck for a little rehab uh, in between going back in and they need some oxygen, we have it here. If for some reason we arrive in an automobile accident or something before uh, rescue gets there, maybe a call that we weren't dispatched to but we were out on the road and, and come upon, we like to have, if we've got the available space, we might as well carry the equipment that Absolutely. we've been trained to use. And go ahead and say it. Door number. Oh, let's see what's behind door number two. Okay. Okay. Oh, look at all the gauges <laughs> and the knobs. This is an air compressor, primarily for filling, filling our breathing air bottles. Now, what would you need those for? Okay. While we're firefighting and doing the overhaul procedures and, and the rest of the stuff that we do in a home during and after a fire, Here's we need to breathe the here. air out of these bottles through one of our breathing packs, which I'll show you in a couple and minutes. And so you need to be able to replenish these things on the scene. You can't exactly. send out to some right. company to have it done when you're we in a fire. We used to send our air bottles out to a dive shop to be refilled, but now we bring the dive shop with us. So. Imagine it's pretty expensive equipment as well. Yeah, and not only expensive to purchase originally, but expensive to maintain. It has to be maintained properly because we're breathing the air. Do the, you check it pump. frequently? Yes. OK, okay lots more, more tanks air bottles. here. We also have scuba gear set and ready to go in. in case we Are have to there go on a... certified divers here at the department? Yes, we try to have two or three on duty at all times 
for the purpose of, a, of maybe a vehicle in a canal, uh, someone in a pool or some open water that you can't see the bottom of where we have to go in and, and dive in with the scuba gear, we need some certified scuba divers on you know, duty it's, it's really times. important that you at home know that these firefighters have to be ready at a moment's notice to be able to respond to whatever happens to you or your family. They have to have everything on board the truck. They have to have all of the training necessary and the know-how to carry out their job well. And, and you know, we commend you for that. It's, it certainly is a, a responsible job. And I'll bet it gets stressful sometime, too. What's behind? Uh, what's behind door, door number, number four? What do you think? This guy wants to show here or what? OK. These are the breathing packs, which I mentioned earlier. OK. These are the, <clears throat> the consist of a bottle, a regulator that brings the pressure down to a breathable uh, pressure. We use a mask that goes on our face. We have a pressure gauge so that we can maintain a, an idea of how much air we've got left and how much time we have left in the building. We have a personal alarm. What this alarm does is as long as we turn it on, I'll let you hear it. Okay. Wow. Okay. As long as we're moving around the building, the alarm stays in the silent mode. If you don't move for 30 seconds, it'll beep and let you know to get back that you need to move again. Wait a minute. If you, Do you don't move, it'll it'll go off and and alert the other firefighters of your whereabouts. Do you mean you there down. are some occasions where you can't see where you're going? Yes. When we go on a fire, usually the smoke is so thick that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Really? Everything that we use, all the knobs are size coded or shaped differently, so we know which knob we have when we have the right knob. A lot of it's like crawling around in the dark. And a lot of times it is dark besides, you know, the smoke. It's kind of hard to imagine being in an environment where you have to use your sense of hearing and your sense of touch to, right. to really find out where you are. I guess you depend on each other usually, a lot. Usually it requires a lot of practice and you need to know your equipment real well so that you're, you know, you know it in the dark. Well, let's move around to the other part of the truck. Boy, this is exciting. I'll bet you didn't know all this was here. I know I didn't. Come on around. Okay. What we have here is a 35-foot ground ladder in case we don't, can't, get into a spot where we can't get one of the larger ladder trucks, we can bring this truck in, have a 35-foot extension ladder, which will take How's us. How does it come out? It's just slide? Yeah, it locks in and, and slides out. We also carry some pike poles and a, and a smaller ladder. This looks uh, like something Dennis used to get out one of my molars right, one time. These are heavy-duty teeth cleaning. They certainly are heavy-duty. Does insurance cover a job like that on your teeth, you think? I, I'm, you just go in there and you do the whole mouth right. at once, the, right? Not, at least not my insurance company. <laughs> okay, these are some lights Big for light. lighting up the scene. If we go to an automobile accident or a house fire at night, if we've got the area illuminated, and no, it's just one more obstacle, we don't have to worry about tripping over unseen hoses and things. And of course, you have your own 120 volt right. source here. We have a generator on board. Uh, it's hydraulically driven off the engine so we can produce enough electricity to run half a city. You must have a giant battery on this truck to run all of your auxiliary lights, have, your emergency lights. We have two batteries. Most fire trucks have two systems, both battery, charging, ignition, uh, really a backup to everything, because we need when we need it, we want it you to be there. You need it. It's right. got to be working. Obviously, right. to keep you cool, right? right? On a hot summer day, you take this out, and all the firefighters sit on a, exactly, a lounge, right? right? Drink the ice water from the other side. That's right. Okay, this is an exhaust fan. Basically uh, evacuates the smoke and other products of combustion out of a building, both after a fire and during it to aid in, in rescue and, and visibility. All self-contained, you don't need right. electricity for Exactly. This. this is a portable generator for running some of the lights and that if it's too far away from the truck to use cords from the truck, we have a portable generator. Hand lights, portable lights, ropes, safety cones, really got it all on here. Absolutely. As you say, you have to have everything. You, you can't be in a position of saying, oh, right. got to go back to the station. Right. I forgot something. This is the actual compressor that com compresses the air. Wow. What we saw on the other side was the filling station where we filled the bottles from. This is actually the compressor. OK, behind door number whatever. I don't think I will see. That was door like number Door number six that. or something. Okay. Door number six. Hey, this is a boat pump. Occasionally, we'll respond to, to boats that are sinking. If we can save it and it's not too far gone, yeah, we saw we'll that try on to pump it out. And, on the uh, Gables waterway. Right. We also have a little submersible boat pump, so we can use the boat. This is a slice pack. Works much like a, a cutting torch. Uh, we can cut through steel bars. Um, with this unit, it runs on oxygen and uses a rod to cut with. Okay. Okay. With this rod, we can cut steel bars off a house at about the same speed you could draw a line on them with a magic marker. Amazing. 
And would particular people be certified in the use of this, or pretty much everybody? Everybody's fairly much, you know, cross-trained. Uh, you'll find one person has a liking to a particular piece of equipment, uh, maybe paid a little more attention in class and, and knows it a little better. And usually when it, when it comes time to put this a tool or a particular device into, into operation, he'll step forward and say, Chief, you know, I'm, I'm real good with that, let me use it. Um, might be a little quicker, but everybody can use it. If we get in a bind, everybody knows everything. You so know, I would imagine that you really have to be intimately familiar with this equipment because when you're out on the scene of a fire right. or some emergency event, you have to know how to use it. You can't sit there and, and say, well, you know, this is a stressful situation. Now what do I right. do next? The owner's manual. can't do that. You know, we don't keep the owner's manual with this because when it's time to use it, there's no time to read the owner's manual. And the last door, okay. but certainly not the least important, I'm sure. Okay. In here we've got a variety of hand tools, which we can go over. We have a, this is called a K1200. It's a, a saw that will both, we can cut roofs for ventilation purposes. We can use it for forcible entry. We can use it for vehicle extrication. Do a little bit of everything with it. Got some small hand tools down here. This is the wrench that opens a fire hydrant. Okay. Every fire truck can't be without one. You ever notice the nut on the top of a fire hydrant isn't square or round? It's, he it's hexagon, and that's what this is for. You know, that's something that I, okay. I never, have never seen that tool before, but we've, we've all seen firefighters checking fire hydrants as you do on routine inspections. Never knew what the tool looked like. Okay. Up here we have and a I'll bet you didn't either, but now you do. Okay. That's why you watch Snapshot. Okay. Over on this side, if you come around this way. You this get a is shot a, of this, Leo. This is a utility tool. We have an axe with a fiberglass handle. They last a little bit longer than the wood ones. Yeah, so, I guess if you had an axe to grind with somebody, you could use this right, to grind we could it. Grind. To... That's Ooh. true. Sorry about that. We'll edit that one out. Okay. Got bolt cutters. Meat hooks in case we get hungry. No, no. These are bail hooks for well, removing a mattress. Everybody knows firefighters right. always get hungry. Right. Sometimes a mattress don't have handles on them, and if we're going to remove a burning mattress from a from a building. We can use these bail hooks. You know, this might also be good for, well, I'm a trumpet player, you know, this might also be good for musicians, you know, when you just don't want to hear them anymore, right. just right off the stage. Kind of good at Halloween, too, if you want to play Captain Hook. Ooh. Think about this guy, folks. You want to let him on this show again? <laughs> well, you sure do know all of the equipment on the truck here. It's This is an interesting... How many, how many years have you been doing this, Charlie Davis? I've been here with the fire department. In August, it will be 11 years. I've uh, been with the city a couple years longer than that. I had various positions with the city, uh, about two years of, of working with public works. I knew when I got on with the city I wanted to become a firefighter. There weren't any positions open, so I got my foot in the door in public works and then moved my way up and, and came I guess over this here. has to be a real labor of love because it is a stressful job. There's no question about that. You, we feel the stress just being here as a, as a TV crew, just waiting for that next alarm to go off wondering what you'll have to respond to. And of course, our responsibilities at the scene are much different than yours are. There is no telling what will come up next. We have to be ready you for everything. have to everything. be ready. What do we have here? Yeah, this is a windshield saw. Um, if we go to an extrication where we, for some reason, want to take the windshield out of a car, this saw has a blade in it that extends out. Let's see if we can get it to extend out. Okay. Okay. And with this, we can use a, a sawing motion and cut the windshield out of a car. It's a very quick device. So you might they say it's it on the cutting saw. edge of technology. This is, this is the cutting edge of technology. Show him who showed this is, won't we? Okay. Now let me, let me ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> Reminds this, me, I'm going to New York very shortly. Okay. This is a Pryax. It's a multi-purpose tool. Um, real handy tool. They've been making them for years. Uh, it will act as a slide hammer, so you can impact something to pry it open. Has a serrated edge here for cutting plaster or lav. Has a point here where you can have a breach point and start prying. It's a real versatile tool. This is one of the tools that I grab when I know I'm going into a fire and I want to have something small with me, compact, that I can do a lot of different things with. Uh, the tool will come apart. You can put this in here and pry with it. It's, it's a real versatile tool for its size. You know, the general public might be interested to know where tools of this quality and this nature can be obtained. By, by the general public. Is there, There's is there a few a different fire these? equipment companies in town. Uh, most of the fire trucks we buy from the manufacturer come already outfitted. Um, basically, when we buy a new truck, it comes with new tools. Um, it's kind of a dual purpose. We get rid of the old tools, get new ones, uh, don't have to worry about the, the tools wearing. About the time the truck's ready to be replaced, so we're all the tools on it. 
Um, naturally, we have some of the favorite tools that come off the older trucks that, that make their way to the newer ones. Sort of like you want to archive those and never right. want to get rid of them. Now, in the cab here, okay. in the cab have... here, we have a back seat, which is for additional personnel. A little buzzing going on inside. Okay. The buzzing inside is telling us that the doors are open. We certainly wouldn't have known that, would we? If... Right. Now, even if they're ajar, quite seriously, it would, it would also signal that. Now, we see that there's a control panel up okay. here. In the center there, the control panel, we have a, a switch there that does, for each sector of light. We have a, a two-way radio so we can stay in communications with the station. We've got a siren switch. We've got our pump engage and disengage, which engages the compressor. We have a, a switch that engages and disengages the generator power. We really got everything. Yeah, there is, there's a whole array right. of switches here. We have battery gauge here. And this just, is your pump power shift. Right. What does this that, do? That engages the hydraulic pump, which drives the generator. The switches on the other side that say pump engage, the ones with the red handles over them, yes. engage the pump, here here. which engages the air compressor for the breathing air. And here, of course, you have your whole bank of emergency lights, right. your strobe lights, and so on. Now, here we have what? Okay, that, that is actually the siren unit. Now, if I push okay. this? With the battery switch on, we would get siren. We have the I battery see. switch off right at the moment so that that buzzing that tells us all of our doors are open doesn't annoy us. And when the public hears the various pitches of siren, okay. Here's the high-low, the right. yelp, the wail, and the radio and standby. So with the radio, you can put the radio into the speakers outside right. so you can hear what's going right. on. The reason we use different tones of the siren is so that when we're behind someone and, and one tone isn't working, maybe not getting through, isn't in their hearing spectrum, we can try another tone. Uh, a lot of people drive with their windows up, the AC on, not really paying attention to where they're going. We try one sound. If that doesn't work, maybe the other one will. Well, this has certainly been very interesting, this tour of the service truck, this piece of fire apparatus. I know I didn't know everything that was carried on these trucks and the control panels. Quite interesting. And we will be back with more right after this. This is where I live. There are lots of doctors and machines for me and the other kids. Last week, a guy named Mike came. He took us all on a camping trip. Mike gives up a weekend a month to help a disabled child, but he gets back a feeling that lasts forever. When I get better, you know what? I'm gonna take Mike fishing. To find out what you can do in your community, call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good, feel something real. Well, we are en route to another emergency call. This reference was a domestic dispute of some kind. What's this all about, Captain Gonzalez? Well, it could be anything. Uh, we're going to an area right off South Dixie Highway. It's uh, an apartment complex. And uh, the only information that we have is that it's a domestic uh, dispute. And it could be anything from a you know shouting match to a slapper here, or you know somebody shot. We really don't know yet. Now, what if we arrive prior to the arrival of the police? And I assume they've been dispatched. Then we're going to have to be very have to be very tactful in the way we approach the situation. So far, Captain, what do we have here? We have what appears to be a domestic uh, situation uh, dispute and uh, she seems to be stable. She looks like she got slapped around a little bit. And uh, Rescue is looking into her condition right now. So basically, what, what's Fire Rescue's function on a call like this? It's a little bit of everything. It's first aid and uh, emotional support and uh, logistical support with the police and stuff. So the police basically would be here to investigate any criminal aspect. And, mm, that's correct. Whereas, whereas your role is much different than that. Right, patient and care. And right now they're administering this basic first aid, and mm -hmm. uh, I see that they're they're using. They're taking vital signs and uh, cleaning up her cut and checking her for you know serious injuries. Okay, we see that she's sitting up at this particular point. She's talking. In these cases, is that likely to change at any at any moment in case there are injuries that, that you don't see right now? Could, sure, could that yeah, change? yeah, sure. That could happen at any time. She seems to be in pretty good shape, though. Would it be likely that she'll be transported to the hospital, or will you most most likely leave her here on the scene to make her own determination as well? Well, I'm not treatment? examining her, so I don't know the nature of her injuries, but the fire rescue lieutenant will make that determination. 
and uh, usually in this type of case here, we usually transport or one of their friends will take her to the hospital. Well, I'll tell you, to me as a layman, uh, what I see here happening with your fire rescue people is it's, it's an immediate kind of a care that they're giving her. There, there's no hesitation. They just go right in there and do their job. Yeah. And this That's is what, what we've for. seen uh, through the in, entire ride here with Coral Gables Fire Rescue. Let's take a look now. Let's continue to watch and see how these fire rescue officers uh, take care of this victim. Mostly what the rescue crew is doing right now, or the rescue officer is doing, he's ruling out certain injuries. And uh, by due to the vital signs and you know the reaction of the patient, we're able to rule out some of the more serious injuries. Is, is some of the the, uh, the reaction, the shaking, so on, could that be caused by just the, the trauma of being beaten on sure. rather than any injuries? Sure, so a lot of it has to do with emotional. So you have to be able to screen that out and really see what yeah. the physical problems are. Right. And I noticed that your, your officers also are doing everything they can, not only just for the, the physical part of this, but, but to try to calm, emotionally calm down Yeah, we give complete service. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed you do. Well, as you can see, the men and women of the Carl Gables Fire and Rescue Department really have a stressful and difficult job to do. This is just one of hundreds and thousands of calls that these men and women have to handle. We thank you for joining us on this edition of Snapshot. I'm your host, Alan Wolf, and until next time, I remind you, keep your focus right here on Snapshot. We'll see you next time.